So welcome all to this final Ask Me Anything webinar. Uh, final because we haven't had so many actually this year, but also final because it's the middle of December. Whenever you're listening to this, uh, that might be uh, weird, but we are at the end of the year. We had a crazy intense year. I think I counted, I have to look back. I will write a sort of overview for this year, but I think around 50 episodes. So almost one a week, um, many, many downloads that we definitely lost track of. Um, a number of interesting Q&A webinars. We haven't done last, a lot of Ask Me Anything webinars, but definitely some interesting Q&A ones with the guys of Perennial Fund. I remember Dan Kittrich at the beginning of the year on nutrient density and recently on um, the nexus between human health and regenerative agriculture, a paper written by uh, David and Mendy, who joined us for a fascinating Q&A. Um, so we've done quite a few Q&As, but not so many Ask Me Anything webinars. I think it came, that is also because we've hosted quite a few together with our, French, uh, with our friends at Fresh, and there there were a lot of general questions as well, so we didn't feel that need. We'll be picking that up in January again. They've kicked off actually their uh, venture studio focused on regenerative food and agriculture, um, which is an, a very, very cool cohort um, building, building companies, and they're starting to build, which is great. I will briefly share my screen, just a few slides for anybody that's completely new here. And as I mentioned before, that means I cannot admit any new people, so they will have to wait. Um, but a very warm welcome here at the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast. Um, this is the December 15th, you know that otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, we've been running this podcast now, we're coming up actually, I think we, we might put some small celebration things online up to five years. So just before Christmas, five years ago, we uploaded the first three episodes. And one of them actually was with Paul McMahon. Uh, that was number three. And we just released yesterday an update with him on SLM, uh, Sustainable Land Management, and their new Silva Fund. Um, so that was five years in the making. I hope it won't take as long uh, to do another update with them um, as it took this time, because they are working on some fascinating things. But as you know, or you don't know, maybe you're not listening to the podcast, maybe you just found this on LinkedIn. We're interviewing people around how to put money to work on regenerating soils at scale, and obviously uh, all the other uh, impacts and benefits. So regenerating people, local communities, and ecosystems at scale while generating a fair return. And I had to add that from um, David Lesax. Obviously, there is a, a very important uh, health component there as well for many people that is one of the main reasons to be in this space. You can find it on all your podcast apps. Definitely let us know if you don't find it because we have to sometimes submit it. Podcasting is very ancient technology and it's uh, very difficult to, to be at all places, but it normally works. Um, and yeah, we've touched more than 150 interviews, I think now we've done a number of series. Uh, we're in the middle of a series around technology and a landscape level, which has been fascinating. And we're preparing some other series as well. Um, so definitely, share it. We've done a video course as well for people that are not too, mu too much into uh, the audio side of things. This is pay what you think is worth. And you can find it on find it on investing in regenerative agriculture.com slash course. And also there, feel free to share, especially for people that want to get started, want to know more, have a, a crash course. We tried to summarize the, the lessons learned over the last uh, four or five years there. And it's uh, available on YouTube as well for anybody to watch. As I said, pay what you think is worth. And we're very thankful for everyone that has been paying for that, which has been absolutely amazing. Um, so what is regenerative agriculture? The question we probably get the most, so let gets, let's get that out of the way, if um, that might have come up in this case. I think it's very difficult to find, uh, probably for good reasons, to find a definition. Um, but this is, a, this is one I, I like from Terragenesis, a system of farming principles and practices that increases biodiversity enriches soils, improves watersheds, and enhances ecosystem services. And there we had to add from David and improves human health. This is another definition. You see the keywords here, I think, are um, increasing, enriching, improving, and enhancing, which already suggests that it's never done. I don't think you'll meet, let's say, an advanced farmer um, that says, no, I'm really done with my system. There's nothing else to explore here. Let's just stop. And uh, I'm just kept, keep running this until, uh, until the end of time. So it's a very interesting moving target. People are constantly inventing new things or reinventing things that have been also already inventing many years ago. 
So just to make it a bit more visual uh, in terms of um, levels, I think there's a very interesting from extractive to sustainable to regenerative, but the best way I think is the way of Ethan Solovyev that showed this in his great article that I recommend to anybody, uh, degenerative uh, on the one side and regenerative. And I think you can plot on any farm or even any farm practice uh, because when done well or wrong, I mean, any practice can be used regeneratively or degeneratively. The outcome can be degenerative or regenerative, but not the practice itself. Uh, fire can be a great tool. Fire can be a horrible tool. And I think the same for finance it can be a great tool uh, to regenerate and can be an absolute uh, extractive a tool to not regenerate, let's say. And um, so just this, for a bit more context, if you, these are some of the practices, many practices, not all, you see most of them coming sort of together in terms of complexity, diversity, covering the soil, um, very limited tilling or disturbance, and in many cases, integration of animals, not in all cases. Uh, so you will see, it's very interesting if you talk to a farmer in India, if you talk to a farmer in Germany, they sort of speak the same language when they are down this uh, route and they, um, they, they literally can learn a lot from each other and probably more from them than from the nearest person in like a big city like Berlin, etc. So it's very interesting. I find it fascinating to see farmers uh, communicate on WhatsApp, many on Facebook groups about these kind of practices and how to go faster. If you want to learn more, dive deeper into the books, into the documentaries, into YouTube. There is so much to learn there. And of course, if you want to follow the podcast, we try to interview many of these as well. And I heard the book of Montgomery, David, and his wife is coming out on nutrient density uh, in 2022. So let's keep an eye out on that. And with that, we I will stop sharing my screen and also admit uh, a few people in the waiting room. And what I like to do in this case um, is to open it up, obviously, for questions. We are with a relatively small group, so we can you can just raise your hand, you can unmute yourself, you can type it in the chat. Uh, I will try to get to as much as possible, but obviously everybody else in the call, feel free to, to answer as well, to put links in the chat, to put resources, reports, etc. I take the whole chat, obviously, anonymize it. Uh, but put it in the show notes as well. So you can uh, look back at this one. What did somebody mention on a book that I should read about that? What did somebody uh, talk about, et cetera, et cetera. So we put it under uh, the YouTube recording of this um, Ask Me Anything webinar. And with that, um, I'm gonna go to Minot, who, or Mino, who put the first question in the chat and we'll start from there. Where using a mix of philanthropic and investment capital, would you place a billion or more? Very interesting question that I always like to ask, uh, especially around the investment side of things. Uh, somebody recently asked me that, and I would say probably, um, I mean, a billion, let's say, let's, let's take the investment side of things first. I would probably one of the biggest lessons learned of this year, I see around the offtake side of things. So what happens after the farm gate or beyond the farm gate, Pete is a good example of that. We need many companies somehow getting this um, ingredients from, from the farm to your table or to a restaurant table or to whatever kind of uh, end consumer we can imagine. And that means in many cases processing, if it's not fresh, um, it means uh, probably mixing other ingredients. We're gonna do an interview with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which published a great report on, um, let's say, changing recipes of, we cannot just buy one cash crop from a farmer, forcing him or her to change practices and then Imagine it's okay. No, we need to buy the full rotation or more than the full rotation. And there, I think there's a whole new generation of food companies that we need that are going to translate all these amazing practices and these amazing ingredients and all these amazing products into something that, that we sort of recognize, like how we're going to make seaweed a staple food in the Western world or in the global North. How do we're going to make a lot of ingredients that we might even sell now for animal feed actually easily accessible for all of us and i think so i would put a big chunk of that that creates a lot of demand for farmers for the supplies so i would put a big chunk of that into a lot of these uh, food companies might maybe even a bit more mature some of them some startups obviously but that already have contracts with farmers that can start buying a full rotation or multiple crops etc and get it into into our bellies and get it into and of course um, significantly pay more to the farmers and make sure of pay, may pay more per hectare, make sure more money gets to the, the, the farm. So I would put a big chunk in that and maybe some of the philanthropic side into research, into nutrient density, uh, support, 
um, the, the Dan Kittriches, et cetera, and, and all the others that I, I don't mention here and really go deeper and deeper into that because it's so fascinating and probably, or at least in my mind, could really unlock a lot of consumer demand if we see um, uh, what food could do and what food doesn't do at the moment. And of course, we hope to do more interviews around that, maybe a series next year to really go deeper into, into that connection. So that would probably be the mix. In terms of continent, very difficult question. I know Europe probably best and, and the US second. So that's just because I'm more, more comfortable with that. Um, so that, that's a difficult question because probably the most impact on acreage we can get and uh, not in the global north, uh, most impact on people as well. Um, so there we we'll do an analysis of where, how the money would go furthest. And, but also it has to be um, close enough to you to feel comfortable to do that. Like if you could build a, a gigantic team and, and you could deploy it all in, in India, probably you can have a lot of impact, but you first have to learn a lot, or at least I would have to learn a lot because I just don't know the space there. We've done two or three interviews and that's it. Um, and I see Eric Jackson also on the call. So on nutrient density, he can, uh, he can fill us in what's happening. Um, Eric, we got a question, um, how I would put a billion dollars to work, both philo philanthropically and investment wise. And I would channel quite a bit into the nutrient density side of things, but I think you would uh, probably agree with me on that. Um, wh what would you do actually? All right, let's just bounce the question to Eric. Eric Jackson, for anybody uh, head of the Bio Nutrient Institute now, what's the official name? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm the chair of the board of the Bionutrient Food Association, and our scientific work is being done through our newly established Bionutrient Institute. So, yeah, this, the two names are sort of interchangeable. We're still refining, still refining what they represent. But, I mean, I would, I would say that, <clears throat> you know, a billion dollars is obviously a lot of money, but the, in, broad, in broad strokes, what's needed is more public research. And when I say public research, I mean research that's not funded with an agenda. And allows the science to, you know, to be scientific. Um, you know, the particular area that I'm interested in right now is trying to draw out the, you know, whatever conclusions we find between farming practices, soil health, and nutrient density in the crops that come off that land, whether it's plant-based or animal-based. And the, you know, what we do know is that the variability is very high in terms of nutrient density. So that's not really very controversial. The question is why. And that requires a lot of research. And so I would certainly gladly take a portion of that billion dollars and point it towards, uh, towards our project. But I, I think the headline is uh, public research that's not funded with, a, you know, with an agenda is really the, the high level that I would seek for that kind of money. And I mean, we've always sort of, uh, now I'm not turning this into an interview, but I'm curious about why now? What, what is, we've always sort of felt um, the connection between healthy food and healthy people and healthy soil is there. But is it like, did technology come a long way now or suddenly attention? Let's say we've said it enough times that more, most enough people and also some people with, uh, with enough resources have started paying attention. Why is it becoming a buzz? Usually? You know, I think, I think for the last, well, certainly during the COVID period, uh, there's been an increasing attention paid to, you know, to healthy outcomes for humans. And one of the vectors for that is obviously the quality of food that we consume. So that's given us a little bit of a boost, but but even before that, yes, I would say technology has has come a long way. Um, you know this, and I would also say that people are realizing that simply making the environmental argument for regenerative agriculture may not be sufficient to motivate the masses. But if you tie that to healthy food, um, you know we might get a much a much faster and, and deeper response. So. You know, sort of like the reverse diabetes project in, in Holland, we've, we've already seen some of the medical professionals have already seen outcomes with patients that have, you know, consumed uh, foods that are grown in a special way. And we don't need to study to death the reasons why, as long as we can draw that correlation out, we can get to work and, and start provisioning that and hopefully create a marketplace that values that. So I think that, I think that the timing's right because we're talking about all these various market attributes in agriculture and because the healthcare uh, system is obviously on fire, so to speak. So with the, 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 with those two things going on simultaneously, it's sort of the perfect, the perfect opportunity to really ramp up this work. Yeah, I think there there's, was an interesting quote, and it sort of answers your question, actually, Megan. Um, in the, um, the paper that uh, Eric actually was part of as well, but was mostly written by David and, and Mandy, 
I think there are 250 citations on um, research papers out there on this connection. And the paper they wrote was sort of an overview study of what we currently know and what we don't know yet uh, on the human neck, the nexus between human health and regenerative agriculture. I, I will put it in the chat as well. Uh, fascinating the different levels that they recognize and, and the framework behind it. Um, and it was a great quote, like we don't have to know exactly how this works and probably maybe we don't, we'll never know, but we know it, it does, there's a huge effect on, um, on human health because of um, healthy foods. And so we can already act even though we don't know the full 100% of how these mechanisms actually work and down to the nutrient level, which we don't even have an, um, specified specifically. So there's there's a lot of unknown there, but enough to act. I think that's the, and, and the, the reasons to act are more than enough. If we look at all the, um, the, the the health issues around us, we don't have to look very far for that. So that's that's very interesting. But what would you say, um, Eric, and then we'll move on to, to other questions. How fast is this going now? You've been looking at it for a bit. Like, is this terms of years that we start connecting these two all the way down to practices? Is it going to be decades or a decade? Like, is this like we're now in 2021, almost at the end? Um, how fast will this this wave go? Uh, you think, or if you had to had to predict something? Yeah, I mean, we've got a very interesting group of funders lined up right now that are that seem to have a strong interest, and if they put, you know, any any of their significant resource behind this, it will go a lot faster. In terms of the audience, you know, I'd say that again, the healthcare community is is paying attention certainly not all corners of it, but there are, you know, certain people like uh, Dr. Stefan von Vliet, um, you know, currently at Duke, moving to Utah State. At the end of the year, uh, Dr. Metabolomics, who's seen, you know, strong, strong indicators in, in patient outcomes based on pastured meat as opposed to grain-fed meat. Um, you know, so if you, have, if you have a few of these indicators out there on both the healthcare side and then back on the agriculture side, you know, we have, we have obviously people are, are really focused in on the environmental outcomes, but if we can draw these two things together at the same time, I'd like to think that, that the research will continue to progress and the marketplace, uh, you know, response will be dependent on sort of the, the validation of, the, of this research. And I don't necessarily think the consumer might pick it up first. We're, we're, we also have a project going to start shipping these products into the healthcare food service sector, you know, relatively early next year. So if we can start you know, in real time measuring outcomes there as well. It might be the healthcare food service sector that drives this and the community-based nutrition programs that drive this because that's the most vulnerable part of the population where every bite counts, right? And so you need to really make sure that, 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 the, that the food that goes in, because it's not much of it, quite frankly, particularly in the elder population, um, that, it, that it's meaningful. And so it can't just be vacant calories. So I, I would hate to prognosticate exactly what the time frame is. No, no, but just that this, yeah. this, this is years, not decades. I think that's yeah, the, exactly, exactly. If things go well. And I think that's very interesting too. I mean, probably I wouldn't say I wouldn't generalize for all of us on this call, but for many, we probably eat relatively well. So the, the benefits of shifting that one ingredient or the one product to the left or the right doesn't really make such a difference. But of course, for people that aren't and are suffering from severe health, uh, challenges, the, the potential is so much larger. We did one interview um, on a project in California where they give this uh, medically tailored meals, simply organic, not, not, not even looking at soil, they're starting to look at soil now, but the impact has been enormous in terms of uh, less um, return visits to the hospital, which are extremely expensive, less complications after severe um, operations, etc. And that's very simple between brackets. Um, getting better food and, uh, to people that normally cannot afford. And the last thing they can think about is obviously getting healthy food because they're battling a very severe health crisis. So I think the biggest bang here is, is definitely with the people that aren't eating this. And that gets it, us into a whole different discussion on uh, accessibility and how do we make this accessible. But the pot of money available for healthcare we've seen over the last decades and especially over the last years is so much larger that we have available for food. So yeah, if we can tap into even a small percentage of that, um, it can help a lot. And I think it sort of answers partly of the question that uh, you asked before on the billion dollars, I would really focus on that food as medicine part. And, and it sounds very weird. I mean, we, we can show a lot of these things and we need a few um, clear examples with very clear outcomes to really uh, propel this and which hopefully creates value change or value webs where farmers can sell into or ranchers or stewards, et cetera. So that's right. what I would allocate uh, quite a bit of. Towards. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. I'll take another question 
and keep uh, slowly moving. Definitely keep them in coming in the chat if you want to. Um, in terms of continent, yeah, like Hannes, what you said, I don't know enough of um, the places I am not too comfortable with to see, but I think the biggest bang for your buck is definitely not in, in Northwestern Europe. Um, but again, there, I, I don't have the, the background knowledge and the, the comfort to, to say, okay, I will put everything in this state in India or everything in Indonesia because of pressure on the rainforest or um, I think there, are, I would allocate definitely a, a big chunk of that to different places with some very experienced people on the ground uh, to, to tackle that. Um, I see a question of yours. The lack of data and transparency in the commodity supply chain. I think that's already a huge, I mean, Eric knows a few things about that as well. Um, is it one of the main, this is one of the main problems of getting more nature friendly and social supply chains on our food. It's a good point. I just don't know how you invest in transparency. Um, apart from food companies that are taking that very seriously, I, I don't know how you invest in the in transparency. So I think that would be um, would be a, a question, a counter question. Like how would you allocate that? But I, I agree, there is a huge transparency issue in almost everything we buy, unless you buy it almost directly from from a producer. Uh, from coffee to grains to other oil seeds etc cetera, etc cetera. everything is getting mixed up and and there i don't know where to invest maybe in some technology companies doing dna dna sampling and sizing to really see what's actually in what which fish you're actually eating um i just read a book eat like a fish um of the founder of green wave a seaweed company and, and there's some very shocking things in there that we all knew but still um very interesting things as well uh, but uh, it's yeah the transparency thing. I don't know how would I would invest in that unless I mean it's sort of a it should be financed by by all of us. But of course it isn't. Um, so I think that would be a tricky one. Remote sensing, true. I mean a lot of satellite companies are popping up, um, but maybe not for one billion. I mean you could spend some on satellite companies for a billion dollars. I see quite a few popping up lately. Um, okay, Hannes. True cost pricing, internalizing externalities. It's not happening fast enough. I completely agree. We did an interview, which has to come out still with the True Price Foundation, if I say the name right, and the Impact Institute, which is the same thing. Uh, they do a lot of these true cost accounting calculations and have a relatively clear pathway of first offering, the, first doing the research, then the step one, transparency, coming back to that. Second, giving people in a supermarket, in a um, in many different ways, the chance to, the opportunity to pay the difference. So this is the gap in your kilo of bananas. If you want to pay for most of the externalities on the environmental side and the social side, it costs you an extra 10 cents, 20 cents. I'm just naming a number here, but it's not a lot. Do you want that? Yes or no? So make it basically an option. And then the third step could be simply mandatory uh, where, because at the end, this is governments to, to step in, but there is quite a large group of people that simply wants to pay that extra bit as well. So there's there's some experiments. It's very slow, but it seems to be catching on a bit lately in the last year or two, at least maybe in, in my circles. Um, so it's definitely, sorry, I see Matt answering in, uh, in the chat. It's definitely a very interesting topic that has come back many times in the podcast. Um, and un until we did this interview, I have never saw a, a clear version of a roadmap. How do we get there? So the interview should be on, I think, beginning of January. So then I, I will invite you to listen to it, but I can also put some more links in the chat on um, the work they're doing around calculating this, which is very difficult, but interesting. And then putting it actually on a bill and giving people the option to actually pay it. And then what happens to that money, obviously, because it's not such a clear connection and let's send it back to the banana grower and, and regenerate his or her land. And then of course, how do we make this mandatory on all the externalities or most of the externalities? we currently don't price into. And let's see, like Matt is saying on the commodity supply chain, need new business models and new policies before they need new data. So Matt, do you want to explain a bit on that side? Like what do you mean by new business models? Um, or I don't know if you're in a position to, uh, to unmute. I don't think Matt is in a position to unmute. So I don't know if I'm filling in for Matt. That means new new company. They can I mean perfect. Um, new business models probably. I mean we've heard a lot about this decommodifying piece. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. Like how much transparency do we want on grain trades, for instance, or how much transparency do we 
actually want on coffee, etc. But you see very successful, still small, but very successful uh, players building, especially in the higher end things that we like to pay for, like coffee, cacao, beer, obviously. Um, wine has always been there. And now you see the large ones like a Mars, et cetera, teaming up with a one, two, three, which we had on the podcast as well, to not only invest in better plantations on the cacao side, but also to do better offtake agreements because they want better quality and traceability, make sure it doesn't come from any um, deforested areas, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if it's going to force like the mid, the, the, the brands are going to force the suppliers or we are going to force the brands, or maybe we're already doing that. Um, but to get to decommodify is 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 going to be interesting and painful probably because we've I mean many companies flourished under the the basically um, how do you say it basically the completely untransparent way of, uh, of of doing business and Eric knows a lot about the grain side of things so if you wanted to chip in yeah I mean the you know years ago we used to have a system. You know, I'll speak to the U.S. situation where there was a multitude of grains grown across the landscape, and so you had a multitude of storage and handling facilities that were sized appropriately. And you know, since we've gone essentially 90% corn and beans, soybeans nowadays, um, you know, scale and fungibility is what's been driving the, the the raw economics. And there's no there's no real incentive to break that down. So, you know the I think the comment that Matt made about policy is true not only in the in the private sector but also in the public sector. You know, it's going to be really, really hard to make to make major changes in the system um, without policies that support you know the, the underpinning agricultural construct that we have. And that's farmers understand it very well. And anytime that they look at a new idea, they hold it up against the existing policy framework and they say, "I don't see the fit." Right, and so and so you get innovators and early adopters in, but the but the early majority is is uh, you know is reluctant, and I don't I don't necessarily blame them. So right now we're chipping around the edges, but until we get until we get policy uh, work done at a at a major scale, this is going to be a slow go. Yeah, no, I see that in in Europe as well. I hope to have an interview soon with some work that's being done currently in France. So they're gathering the let's say the successful agroecology or regenerative farmers that have built a significant scale or at the edges still, but significant scale, financially very successful, working with a lot of people, um, very stable jobs, et cetera, and trying to put them together and start lobbying first in Paris, then in Brussels, but to show that there's an alternative, that there's actually a current economic force that despite all the policies that go against them, are making it work and are selling out and are generating interesting returns for interesting impact outcomes, et cetera. And to show that this is not all um, very, very fun and small on the edges, like a few market gardens here and there, which are super important, but to show significant force, like look what happens if you change the policies, even slightly, or if you even remove a lot of policies that currently work against it. We need to show examples. We need to show a successful example because otherwise, People, the policymakers have um, actually a, quite a strong movement. And so there's the first gathering because we have a, a chance every couple of years in Europe to change the, the cap. And there is a, there's a chance coming up, obviously, in a few years. And we need to significantly lobby um, and significantly put the gay browns of Europe in, uh, in, in the calls in Brussels and in Brussels itself, because otherwise you only get the, the protesting ones on the tractor. And, and that's just not a very... Um, very constructive way of changing the cap. And I see a few people now starting to wake up to the fact like we need to show successful examples in Europe and throughout just to, and in other places as well, simply showing, okay, this can be done. You can pay wages. You can actually produce a lot of food and you don't necessarily have to compromise on a lot of other things, but it's, it's a long way. I mean, we start to, we can learn from, I think the renewable energy space quite a lot that have done that successfully here um, and still a long way to go, obviously. I see Jos commenting on Matt. There's a huge demand for this transparency. Um, and that's always the question, like what's going to come first, regulation of um, uh, until when these pioneers get, get strong enough. Um, it's going to be a very messy, messy transition, I think, in, a, in, in an interesting way. I mean, for our standards, of course, for farmers, it's extremely difficult at the moment. Um, that's true. They did a very interesting comparison study in, for regenerative dairy in the Netherlands part. Um, I saw that as well, 
on basically showing that uh, the financial outcome for these farmers were more or less the same, uh, or more on average, sorry, in even challenging uh, um, regulation environment that maybe is going to change with, we just got a new government in the Netherlands, but let's see. Uh, they promise a lot of things as always. Uh, let's see if that ch changes, but at least they're not losing money or they're not worse off compared to uh, their um, conventional neighbors. So that's a very encouraging thing. I'll see if we can find something in English on that to put in the show notes. Um, any other questions? Let's keep them coming if you have them in the chat uh, or if you want to unmute and, and go for it. We're a relatively small group. Go ahead, Weir. All right. Uh, obviously, love the podcast. Thank you very much. Um, so I, this is not quite in your wheelhouse, maybe. Um, you mentioned it before, but like how essentially how do we help small um, holder farmers in the global south transition and there's a couple of assumptions baked in there like a lot of them were doing something regenerative beforehand and then you know in industrial stuff came in the 60s or whatever um, but if you have any thoughts on that I know you've done a couple of interviews with, with Mark and a couple of others um, or if you know of anyone who maybe is better to speak to on the on that point I think it really depends as always what they're farming uh, in a way like is there if there's a, a cash crop leaving the country or being processed etc i mean that's of course an interesting angle to work on i know hannes you're in east africa at the moment so you have a lot more to share here i think i think the people have grounded in south africa are working on these cash crops and a lot of other crops are doing some very interesting work india is happening a lot on the um, zero budget natural farming um, whole regions are transitioning and, and cutting out uh, very expensive input subsidies uh, for uh, all kinds of chemicals, fertilizers, etc. So it really, really, really depends. I think uh, if there is a cash crop leaving, then th there's an angle we can work on there. If there's a huge subsidy scheme currently for chemical fertilizer, that's an angle that can be, can be done. Um, it, it's very difficult to say. I think that the challenges are similar to, to any other farmer, which means um, transition is very difficult if you have done it for even the last 10 years or the last couple of years if the whole system around you in terms of um, uh, knowledge is is geared towards uh, pushing more inputs then it's going to be very difficult to change and of course offtake and, and markets like is there any market that uh, is is paying for let's say cleaner less chemical less input um, more tasty are there any restaurants around is there any tourism industry uh, that that can and will pay for these things, then that that changes. I mean, I was talking to you, not necessarily the the worst of country, but uh, we did an interview with Paul Chatterton recently on Fiji, and there you see the tourism industry that imports most of its food from overseas, which is extremely expensive, and now starts to recognize the local, the few local farmers, and the rest that wants to transition from sugarcane to um, less input heavy ones that obviously also help the reef outside Fiji to potentially recover because it's been basically bleached by a lot of chemical fertilizer. So it, it really depends on the local context, what, where makes sense. But I think, um, I don't know if he fell off the call, uh, but Hannes is working in, uh, I think it's Uganda. I'm going to probably get this wrong uh, on a lot of these things. I think there's, there's as much possibility just with the different context as we've been in other places. And actually what we've seen in uh, one, two, three, share that there's also others. It's very difficult to get high quality fertilizer in some other places and very difficult to get high quality seeds so the prices people pay for input might be a lot higher in, in places than you would expect um, based on where they're located. But Hannes, you, you might have a few thoughts because I'm basically able to share general ones and point to other people like yourself. Yes, sorry, Ma. thank you. Ma, my internet just dropped when you started talking. So um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm in Uganda and in, in, um, I'm, I'm working on a startup studio like Fresh Ventures actually is doing now in Europe uh, and I'm, I'm currently fundraising to start up a pilot phase for that uh, here in, in Uganda to start with. Um, I, I didn't really hear your question, but I, I think what's important for me is to um, bring uh, talents, uh, money, resources together to uh, allow local entrepreneurs to build the solutions that fit best in their food systems, right? And and uh, and. and of course, um, inspiring them with some uh, regenerative agriculture uh, and steward ownership principles, focusing on social entrepreneurship. Of course, that's basically what, what I want to uh, do uh, in a couple of words. Um, but I, as you said uh, before, uh, 
uh, answering to my question on the continents. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, people impacts uh, and even environmental impact, health impacts might be uh, um, highest in the global south and in, in places like, like here in East Africa um, because of uh, yeah, the, the risks of pesticides and other uh, sources of contamination on, on the food that we find in markets here actually being very, very high. No, so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it with that. Great, thank you, Hannes. And I hope that the internet connection stayed. Um, any other questions? Just raise your hand or unmute yourself. Uh, we have some very interesting people in the in the audience, as you can see. So I just, uh, make a use of that. I wanted to, like, uh, a while ago you were going, like, why are there more um, questions now around the health that comes from the, nutri from the food? And uh, you are mentioning technology and stuff. I, re I really have the feeling as well that this, there's kind of a bottom-up thing, like we see cancer going up, we see allergies going up, we see all kinds of diseases going up, and I think people are trying to find where is this coming from. And a lot of places coming, going then back to the food that's being eaten. Like I hear stories of people that are lactose intolerant, but then they can eat the raw milk from the farm if it's a regenerative farm. Maybe not because it's regenerated, just because of the practices that are there. People that can't eat and are allergic to apples, but if they've been grown organically, they can eat them. So like, I really feel that that's major pressure because like healthcare costs are going up as well. People want to be healthy. We have space now and time to think about why am I not healthy? And, and I think that's pushing a lot in this direction as well. So I think I, th I totally agree with you. I think if, we, if you can market that side, if that would be possible to market, that'd be a great way to, to sell it more and, and make the transition easier. Um, so how would we sell this? Because we've we've tried it with the superfood, the superfood bonanza. Yeah, the and superfoods really work. <laughs> yeah, but then people go for the superfood. Well, that's yeah, why it's a combination. I think of things, really. Right? Sorry, go ahead. But I think it's really important that the. I mean, the, the reason I've been pushing this on the community-based nutrition programs and the general healthcare food service area is because that area things can be specified, but, right? Wait. So it's not necessarily consumer choice. On the one hand, on the other hand, you stand the chance of actually being able to measure on that end all the way downstream data is being collected about outcomes with regards to patients and clients and, and, you know, folks who are being served through these programs. So to me, that's, I don't know. I, 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 I sort of gave up on trying to convince the consumer of this first. I think we have to demonstrate through some projects, uh, you know, what the outcomes are. No, for sure. For sure. But like, I know that in, in country, in certain countries, like I used to live in Brazil, they, they, can sort of discriminate based on age. And so your, your insurance, health insurance goes from, I don't know, $50 and then it becomes a hundred and then you're 70 and suddenly $500. Um, if you could link it to this in a way, mm -hmm. if that's legal, because in, in certain countries that's not legal because that would be a form of uh, discrimination. Um, well, we do have we do have health insurers that are now starting to focus on outcome based programs, right? Okay. So historically, health insurance has paid for procedures, which is why you see all this fancy equipment and all these expensive testings because that's what health insurance has been paying for. Now, you know, here in Minnesota, anyway, Blue Cross uh, of Minnesota has you know several projects with several local healthcare providers to refocus now on outcomes. You know, so readmissions. Yeah. Um, healthy outcomes of the patients and to compensate on that basis. And if that, if that catches fire, everybody's incentive then to, you know, to look at all the causes for those outcomes. Food is certainly central A to big that. one, yeah. Oh, that'd be great. So we should go after the insurance company, the one that pay at the end. I mean, we all pay, but the insurance companies are, are the first one in line and they costs have just exploded over the last years. Yeah. For, I mean, because we, yeah, the incentives went the wrong side like you you were paid for um for uh, for surgery etc instead of for the outcome i think it it there were certain somebody said that once probably it, it's just not true but there were certain villages i think in china where the doctor was paid or the one that was uh, responsible for health was paid for basically to keep everybody healthy it was paid for the outcome that as well 
Yeah. But I, I, mean, I, you, I just, you don't pay just him when you're nice. ill. Yeah, it just sounds <laughs> nice. I, I tend to believe it, but I'm not sure if it's sure if it's true. But it does it does sound very interesting. Like we we should be paying our, our family doctor if we're healthy and not necessarily the other way around. Um, but that's probably a bit too too romantic in, in this case. But I think the health outcome, that's why not to to just push our webinar, but I think the one we did before on and also that paper I just put in the chat as well on the nexus between human health and um, region ag is is a very interesting starting point they're working on another one on the investment side of things so i'm very much looking forward to that as well like where would you then invest and how would you invest philanthropically hopefully they can answer that one billion dollar question uh, how would you invest philanthropically in the space how would you invest non-philanthropically in the space and not just go for the the fancy superfoods uh, because that's we've tried that and, and we made kale the superfood and, and many of those other things um, and probably that's not the way to go um we'll, we'll do for sure more interviews on this side uh, of things next year as well just to try to yeah to separate the noise from uh, from the interesting things at least for us I mean, this is always a personal one of course any other um any other questions unmute and hit it any other, also non-healthcare related obviously if you want to ask something ask something completely different I do have. I'll just go with no one's going. Go <laughs> uh, on the on the actually regenerative agriculture side, I know there's a lot of legislation saying, okay, you have to do this, you have to do that on on what's on the current system. Um, and here in the Netherlands, I'm starting to get to know it more in terms of there's there's restriction on how much you can produce, and there's restriction on how much nitrogen, there's restriction on this and that and that. But what like and because we're talking a lot about soil and we can measure soil organic carbon quite easily um how how would we sort of create a framework where you can say okay this is measurable across many many hectares uh, to say this is the measure that makes something regenerative or that makes something positive for us is it just store organic carbon needs to go up and the biodiversity of the the bacteria and fungus in your soil needs to go up and then there are no other restrictions would that be a way to have it work at least for to 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 make it a very easy way to to be able to push it towards where we would want it to go you're asking so you're asking if there should be a super complex set yeah, right of now there's a yeah. super complex set of criteria in terms of restrictions and then I would like to have a, a like everyone's been talking about that get be goal oriented outcome oriented etc but it's like what are the two three things that that are easy to measure and easy to sort of put in legislation and can't go wrong like always if you put something in legislation they tend to go it will wrong. be gamed yeah yeah exactly that's a very so, it's an interesting question i've probably again probably depends on, on place but i've heard somebody say i misquoted it probably before it might have been mark shepherd or or somebody else that said if you want to know how a farm is doing measure the water quality like on the lowest point of the farm like the runoff water and i recently pushed that to a company we didn't interview yet called nature metrics that paul chatterton mentioned um and that are able to if i understood it well I, again i didn't interview them yet um with uh basically they analyze water and are able to tell mainly in the conservation space like what animals are upstream in that river so they were able to tell um from a very small amount of water that there were a number of different hippos in some places of that river that nobody that everybody thought they were extinct and i basically answered okay can, can you do the same but then on a much smaller scale with different animals like if this farmer or upstream in this lowest point where we collected the water what has been happening on the farmland and they mentioned they could probably do that. So I, I don't know if that's the easiest because water tends to go downstream. And I don't know if you can cheat with that. Probably you can, but we need something as simple as, as that. And I think they even do um, like this water sampling. The collection is very easy. I don't know if it's going to be a satellite system to monitor. I, I think it's probably um, as Super Stephanie is doing the same thing, water quality. Um, as it flows, yeah, the DNA side of things, super interesting. Like, what does that tell us and how easy is it to game that? I mean, you can push up soil carbon, organic matter probably by bringing 
a lot of compost or a lot of things onto your farm if nobody yeah. monitored that you can play with that yeah, that's well. why you, you need can, the dna <laughs> you can you can you can play with a lot of things i'm imagining especially if there's a lot of money at at a game so i don't know i mean stephanie what would you say i don't know if you can unmute what would be the easiest most cost effective way to monitor large pieces of land it's not one or two metrics i mean that's essentially our our whole business i was just texting you another no, the only thing water quality is going to show you is uh, the sediment transport and possibly the nitrates and phosphates. So it's just going to show you what your leaching is. But that has to do with the inefficient use of nutrients, whether it's mineral fertilizer or an organic amendment, it could be manure. Um, so when you look at water quality as a proxy for regenerative agriculture, it's not really I would say with a couple issues. One is it's not spatially explicit. The second is, you know, you could be pulling off data that relates back to the inefficient use of, of nutrients uh, on farm, whether it's an organic amendment or, or a mineral fertilizer, um, or it could be even manure from a grazing operation. So it's, it's just one, one of several metrics. Uh, Nature Metrics is a company that does eDNA. We do the same thing. Their core innovation is just doing smart sampling and identifying the microorganisms in surface water. And we've been doing that for about 12 years. So I say it's nothing new. Their business model is more about creating a, an inventory of what biological and really microorganisms exist in, in surface water. We measure different biological attributes associated with fish habitats. So this is pH, dissolved oxygen, and temperature as it relates to the enforcement of legislation. The gentleman who was asking the question before, you know, what, what's the simplest way to, to measure whether or not we've achieved nirvana on regenerative agriculture, I think really depends upon uh, what the producer is looking to do. Like in the UK right now, we're working with 700 dairy producers on a regenerative agriculture program. And they are trying to come up with their net zero emission to, you know, things so that they know what kind of carbon surplus they could have to trade on external voluntary markets. But their bigger issue has to do with the management of manure and nitrates and phosphates as it relates to leaching, uh, both in adjacent surface water as well as in the catchment. Uh, what they've asked us to do is they've asked us to work on biodiversity monitoring because their customers ask them to do that and their customers willing to part with money, i.e. just pay them for practices. So I think there's a, you know, a big decision that the agricultural communities have to make about taking the money from their customers to get paid for practices versus actually setting up performance metrics on their, their baseline and then monitoring against a baseline in line with their goals to achieve outcomes, which essentially sets them up to actually have a business case for why they're doing regenerative in the first place. So I think to, to answer the gentleman's question, I didn't catch his name, but uh, to answer his question, is there a simple way that we can just get on with it and try and encourage people to do this? The answer is not really. And the reason for that is each producer has got a different business case for why they're doing regenerative and I'm happy to I don't want to monopolize your call I'm going to stop answering <laughs> um, for, for me do, but you're doing exactly what more, I think uh, what I would think you would be doing it's more like, complicated than than it you seems create, you create a baseline and you just that like from the baseline every year just needs to go up in terms of biodiversity no. uh not necessarily so no okay I, no so <laughs> so there's two different ways these programs are being implemented one is being paid for practices, which doesn't involve a baseline. The other is being paid based upon yeah. outcomes or achieving outcomes and achieving a business case independent of what your customer is paying you to do. And typically you do that if you're actually thinking about getting proactive, not just with compliance to legislation, but creating additional revenue streams to sell your externalities on no, that, I'm, I'm just thinking but globally. What, I'm thinking, okay, we say yeah, globally, everyone global. measures, measures, measure the soil, you have a baseline, go improve on that. That won't work. <laughs> I'll say it again. There's two <laughs> different ways. There's no, that, that's, that's a simple way of putting it, but that's not how it's working in real life. 
So there's two different ways this is being interpreted. One is uh, paying for practices. So a lot of the food and consumer products companies are putting it out there to say they want their all their suppliers, all their growers and their agricultural supply chains to produce regeneratively. And instead of going through the work, because it is work to establish a baseline and then monitor against, not just against the baseline, but you establish goals first after you get the baseline in place. And then it's like me saying, I'm gonna lose 50 pounds. Well, I need to weigh myself first to know what I'm measuring against. Then I need practice changes, i.e. I need to start eating differently and exercising. And then I need to monitor my progress against my baseline. So that's best in class. What most, I must say most, but many producers are doing right now is they're taking the money from their customer because the customer is sitting there saying, we'll pay you for practices independent of establishing a baseline because we just want you to get started in doing this stuff. And we'll allow you to self-report your progress against what you think your baseline is as opposed to actually establishing the rigor associated with establishing a baseline implementing the practice changes and then monitoring using an independent method, i.e. scientific methods, not just satellite remote sensing, but a whole host of different ways to keep track of how somebody's doing against their baseline. So back to the other thing you said about monitoring against a biodiversity baseline. I think the challenge with biodiversity is it means so many different things yeah. to so many different people. It's so soil microorganisms, all the way through to say a diversified species of grass that you might be grazing if you're a pasture-based dairy farmer, all the way through to arthropods and insects and slugs and then birds, fish and mammals. So where do you wanna go in the stack? So we've devised different ways just, to do Just a soil sample stuff. really. <laughs> well, a soil sample of what though? Soil sample, just soil Ste organic. Stephanie, carbon, but I, I can put you in a breakout in a breakout. So, yeah, no, if you no, want to. Like done. <laughs> we have a couple it's of good. minutes left, and and I want to not get into the the question of math actually, uh, which is as uh, let's say something to chew chew on, um, as we're gonna pay for for um, let's say the carbon credits. I mean, we're gonna actually it's starting to happen already around carbon and potentially around biodiversity but then Stephanie raised a very good question what do we mean by biodiversity and what do you actually want to measure but should these credits be only available to food and agriculture companies or should they be available to wider to the wider let's say um, business world I'm not going to get into that because I want to use the last few minutes of this last uh, ask me anything webinar of this year to actually turn it to you what do you want us on the podcast and, and the things we do around the podcast to do more of next year? Is it, let's say, the oceans, regenerative aquaculture? We're looking into that. Is it uh, more podcasts, more interviews? What, what are the main things we can do better uh, or more of or change, actually, for the next year? You can put it in the chat if you want. If you can't unmute, you can unmute yourself. Keep it brief so we have time for a few people. Or should we just do exactly the same thing next year and copy uh, what we did in uh, in 2021? I think that's, uh, oh, I see messages coming. Matt is answering to, to Stephanie. I take that as we do exactly the same uh, as we did this year, more interviews. Perfect. Let me it's know. Really, it's anything. really difficult, Kun. Yeah, I know, like, I know. It was a great year. Like, I get 80% of my information. I read a lot and I get a lot of other stuff and I read a lot of papers, but 80% of the interesting stuff comes from your podcast. So that's. <laughs> that's a huge responsibility, actually. I, yes, that's it not, is. That's not, not, to take, responsibility. <laughs> not to take that lightly. True, William. Yes, more smallholder, smallholder side of, let's say, not the, the, the side on this. Ongoing updates on interviews are great. That's absolutely true. It does raise an interesting challenge, Arne, that we have to make more interviews because we've done so many in the past. And I promise every time, oh, let's check in in a year. And that, as you know, that never happens. Um, you yes, you could also do that in, in not, not, not specifically as an interview each time, which takes a lot of time. You could also maybe try to figure out another format on keeping track of these 
uh, interviewed businesses or projects. Just a thought. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, it it does get us into what we discussed with Pete at the beginning. I, I used some software on that on asynchronous recording to cut down time, of, and then we we get stuck in a in a piece of software that doesn't really let me download it anymore. So, but it there are some places for that i i'm doubting about it because it does take a bit away of this um recording on the moment in a sense that there is that interaction that that is very special and, and doesn't happen when you do it asynchronous so i'm struggling a bit with that but at the same time yeah the updates are are very fun to do as well or even potentially written with to think about that action um don't give up as a climate solution. Absolutely, we need to, thank you Trudy. There's the much deeper into, I think the landscape size thing is very interesting in terms of water, in terms of um, actual climate impact, like local climate stabilization. Uh, I mean, we, we talk about bringing back rivers, et cetera. Uh, there's, there's a lot there uh, that, we, that sounds almost like science fiction, but probably can be very, very interesting. Uh, maybe group five following what together could be interesting. Yes. Scheduling is a huge uh, challenge as well, Bart, to get people on the same time, on the same call. It's um, region, ag, and other sectors. Very interesting you bring it up, Megan. We're thinking about, there probably will be, no, there probably, I'm recording a fashion one actually on um, luxury footwear next week. So let's see how that falls in this group. Let me know what you thought of that after we put it live, obviously. Uh, the cosmetic side of things is very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, margin side for many, many farmers. Um, uh, biodiversity markets, yes, we'll be diving into that. Um, I want to interview, I have to look up a few companies actually on bioacoustics, using sound to record a lot of things. For sure, Stephanie knows a few things about that. I have to connect with her. Um, but how do you, yeah, what do you actually measure? I've seen a few things on that side of things. Um, the other sectors, I do, I'm, I'm worried that we then get like, we get, get way too far from food and egg. Um, yes, clothing, furniture, but fungus. I mean, there's, there's a whole lot to discover there. And as I said before, I think very under um, served uh, the ocean side of things or the water side of things, the, the 3D farming, the vertical farming water, or the, the vertical in, like aquaculture side of things of farming. Um, Seaweed is a, we probably can do 10 series on seaweed, just on seaweed uh, to, to explore that. Okay, these are all great suggestions. Thank you so much for that. We're on top of the hour. I wanna uh, end on time, which we're not gonna do because it is one minute over. So I wanna thank you all so much, first of all, for listening, for commenting, for getting in touch this year. We had many people get in touch, which I love. Sorry if I answered late in some things because it is uh, truly overwhelming. Um, but it's been uh, one uh, one hell of a year, and we're we're planning for definitely another one. It feels like the wave has been been going, and uh, now it's time to to surf it and get as far as we can possibly get with uh, uh, with this platform that somehow accidentally got created. Um, so we'll definitely be keep going. Thanks to all of you for listening, connecting with us, connecting us with people building interesting things. Uh, we're always looking for more stories, although we have a long list. I think 100 plus 150 interviews that I want to make, that doesn't mean we're not looking for uh, new stories, doesn't mean we're not looking for update stories. If you have something, definitely get in touch and keep sharing the information, keep uh, listening, keep uh, giving feedback and hope to see you in the new year.